Okay. So hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Stargazing for Families webinar. My name is Kaylee. I'm the Experiential Education Manager here at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Uh, I'm joining you today from Calgary, which is in the traditional territories of the Treaty 7 nations in Southern Alberta and the Métis nations of Alberta Region 3. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Ian Wheelband from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Ian is the Astronomy Outreach Coordinator for the RASC Toronto Centre and a big part of his role is providing educational programs, demonstrations and tours to help inspire people of all ages to connect with the night sky. At the Canadian Wildlife Federation we think it is so important to connect families to nature because often our love of nature is sparked when we are kids. You know, it's found on family camping trips and picnics while climbing trees and standing out under a starry night sky. And there are also so many physical and mental health benefits to spending time outside, both for kids and adults alike. And that's why this year we're piloting a new series of webinars focused on families as part of our Wild Family Nature Club. In June, we kicked it off with a session on birding for families. And now I'm very excited to continue the series today with a session on stargazing. Uh, now, before we get started, I hope you've all had a chance to download your uh, very own star finder uh, using the link included in the webinar reminder email. And if not, no fear, we'll include the link in the chat so you can print one later. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Ian so that we can get started. Over to you, Ian. Oh, thank, thanks very much, Kaylee. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, Kaylee's in, in um, Calgary. I'm joining you from just outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia. I spend part of my time here and part there. Um, my background for astronomy and outreach is, is uh, all amateur. I started w when I was uh, late high school um, with, with Cubs and Scouts and have continued on until now. I'm not going to tell you how many years that is. Too many, but um, it's been a big part of my, my amateur, my hobby life. and, and uh, I love, as, as Kaylee had mentioned, things outdoors. I just love outdoors and getting kids involved. So I dragged my kids to the telescope. I was outside. I, I love skiing and hiking and, and canoeing and kayaking and all those sort of outside things. And astronomy fits right in. So I'll jump into my presentation. Uh, I've got some PowerPoint slides. Um, I'll go through a couple of astronomy programs and Kaylee and I will chat a, a few times and maybe there'll be some skill testing questions too. So here we go. Uh, this one. Okay, so uh, for, that's that's me at, at my telescope. I'll talk a little bit later about that. First thing I would like to say today is that um, here in, if it'll go, there we go. I'd like to begin um, by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship which Mi'kmaq peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. Now the treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized the Mi'kmaq and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. And I really like this picture that's the background there. It's showing a group of people working together. It looks to me like they're tearing down a fence rather than building it. And there's, there's three nation flags there, Nova Scotia, Canada, and the Mi'kmaq flag all flying on equal flagpoles together and with, with today's kind of news I think this is what we need here. So carrying on, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Um, we are a not-for-profit charity, all of us are volunteers, myself included. There are 30 of our centers across the country, usually in the bigger towns and cities, so you know Vancouver, Calgary, Victoria, Halifax, Toronto, Montreal, a few of the smaller towns as well. Um, we've got nearly 5,000 members uh, worldwide. Uh, most are Canadian, of course, uh, but some are from, from other countries, Europe, United States. And importantly, membership's open to everyone and, and families. And for me, the biggest part about membership is being able to share with and learn from others out under the night sky and even in, in, in meetings too. So that, that's, that's RASC. Um, I thought I would tell you about my interest in astronomy because it started when I was a young lad as well. And, and perhaps um, what happens to many people, um, Santa Claus came one night and got me a telescope. 
And it was one of those terrible department store kind of telescopes. I guess my Santa Claus mom and dad didn't know much about astronomy, but they, they knew I was interested in all things outdoors and sciency. So they got me this telescope. And, uh, you know, I, I did what people normally do. I looked at a few stars. Oh, they're just stars. I uh, looked at the moon, looked at some flowers, looked at the bugs on the flowers. And one night I decided to go out under the sky and, and look at a few of the brighter things in the west sky and um, see what I could see. And sure enough, a few of the stars were just pinprick stars. And OK, that's not exciting. And I found another re reasonably bright, bright object. And this picture is meant to be me looking down through the eyepiece. And what did I see when, when I saw that? But I saw this this fuzzy image and I realized, oh wow, this is Saturn. And and probably more than that, um, the first it, it was the first time I'd ever actually seen it real and live. And every time I'd seen Saturn before that point in time, it had been nothing more than a picture in a book. I mean, there was no internet back then. Um, so so it was it was, you know, brought brought shivers to me saying, well, wow, this is real. And even today, when I go out, um, kids of eight to 80, and really those ages who get their first look of Saturn, they're just absolutely thrilled with it, or, or anything really, even the moon um, and seeing the craters and mountains just inspires interest. So that was it for me, getting that first look and going, wow, and the rest is, is history. Um, so that's, that's how I got started. Um, I do want to talk just a little bit about my time machine, and I, I really wish it was this one, this, this Doctor Who, where you could go forwards and backwards anywhere you want. Um, but we do have, we as astronomers do have a time machine. We just call it a telescope. Um, this is one of those pictures that I wish was a video. It, it's my youngest daughter, Hannah, who's now a nurse in Ottawa. Um, but this is Hannah getting her very first look at Saturn. And of course, dad had made this pretty spiffy telescope for her to have a look and she was getting an absolutely spectacular view. But the words she's saying just brought me back to my own youth and, you know, dad, dad, you should see this. It, wow, it's the real thing. And she was just as excited as me. And she's, uh, you know, gone on to a science uh, career and um, continues to be, you know, my astronomy kid. The other one's a music teacher. So uh, perhaps not so sciencey, but still interested in, in the world around her. The reason I, I call this, this thing my time machine is that telescopes, all they do is they gather light and then we magnify it. Um, and light in, in particular is one of those things that has a finite speed. Uh, 300,000 kilometers a second is, is the, uh, the, you know, the actual number seven times around the earth every second. So what it means is that when light bounces off something or shines from something, so shining from the sun, or bouncing off something like Saturn, um, it takes, or even the person sitting next to you, it takes that finite period of time to get to you. And that means that um, number one, you can measure uh, distances to astronomy objects by saying time. And you'll often hear the word light year, which is the distance light travels in one year, or with the sun, it's eight minutes and 20 seconds away, um, uh, or, you know, or, the other thing to think of is that what you look at and everything you see is actually in the past. And so the telescope is truly a time machine and it lets you see in the past. And I've seen things through my telescope billions and billions of light years away. Um, my, my record object with, with this is 10 billion light years ago. When, and when you think about that, that's... Um, you know, the Earth is only four and a half billion years old. So the light that left this quasar is what I looked at, came more than two times uh, ago from the birth of, of, of our solar system and our sun. And maybe back to that sun for a moment and, and the, the thought of this time travel and the time and how far away things are with astronomy. Um, imagine you're in a car and you get in a car the day it was first invented by uh, Herr Benz in, in Germany back in the late 1800s. And he invented uh, this horseless carriage, this automobile. And let's say that it could go 100 kilometers an hour back then. The cars couldn't back then, but let's just say that it would. And you got in uh, 125 years ago and decided, I'm going to drive to the sun. And, you know, if there's you know, gas stations on the way in the road, which is not, but let's just say you would do that. And you'd still be 45 years away from getting to the sun. 
if you'd have driven every day, night and day since 1895, you wouldn't be at the sun yet. Yet light gets there in eight minutes, 20 seconds. So that's two things. One, light's fast. Two, the universe is really, really big. Um, however, my time machine here never allows me to look in the future, only the past. That's just the way it is. Thought I'd also talk a little bit about what amateur astronomers do. And these three images uh, kind of gather it up for me. Uh, the top left is my buddy Len, and Len and I are doing some, uh, uh, we've gone out to a wilderness area. This is actually near Gravenhurst, Ontario. And we've got our imaging telescopes ready to take images of the night sky. And we've got this, this visual telescope. Um, I think this might've been, been the first time we actually used this one that I had made. And we're gathering together, sharing the night sky, being outside together. Um, bottom left is a star party in front of the Ontario Science Centre, where my fellow RAS colleagues will come and show the night sky, give others that first view of Saturn. And then the bottom right is a star party in the day. And you might think star party, okay, I know what that goes, what goes on at night, but you'd probably be surprised. Um, if it's dark and clear, um, Star parties are really quiet. Um, you'll hear the odd little person going, ooh, as they find something neat, or wow, did you see that as the meteor goes by? And of course, nobody saw it because they happen so quick, everybody misses it, except the person that goes, wow, did you see that? No. Um, but anyway, that's the star party. And, and now if you think about a cloudy sky night, it's exactly the kind of party you might think it is. Um, but what do we do there? Well, obviously there's the visual astronomy part and we take images of the night sky. I'll show you some that I've taken here. Uh, we do this kind of stuff, public outreach. It's, it's really, uh, really exciting. We have, you know, the club societies. Some, some of us make telescopes. There are many that are really keen to follow space exploration. And some of us actually are, are helping with real professional research. At the end of the, the show today, I'll talk about how you, with your families, can contribute to real research um, using a web app. And um, this was kind of exciting for me. I joined a research project with the Lowell Observatory down in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I actually got my name published in the Astrophysical Journal, which is like the big, you know, okay, that's uh, first star. I like that. Um, so that's really neat how even with, even amateurs can contribute to real science. Um, so the first thing here, I think this is a, this is a chat. I'm going to stop sharing for a bit. Actually, no, I'll leave that, leave that there and leave it to, to um, uh, Kaylee to open up the, the chat things. What do you think you can see in the sky with only your eyes? Now, what I mean there is um, obviously some of us need these uh, corrective lenses and um, I'm too close to my computer screen to need them on. But um, what do you think you can see? No telescope, no binoculars, but only getting out and uh, so uh, give you 30 seconds or so. I see a few people raising their hand. Uh, yeah. What do we have to do here, Kaylee? Well, and if I you guys want to just add your notes to the chat box, you can um, share some of the things that you might have seen in the sky. I see something starting to come in. Ian, do you have the, the chat box Looking. open? Because I see I someone. Cassandra says Jupiter. Gail Cox says oh. Milky Way. Andrew says planets, comets, stars. Wow, those are, those are all great, great things. Yeah, Milky Way, planets, stars, comets are really cool. Um, I'm looking for the chat box. I, for some reason, I, I see lots of stuff, but I don't see the chat box. No worries, the, oh, I'll keep or reading. Is, oh, is it Q&A? Wait a minute, there we go, is that it? We got no, that's, the chat that's... with the constellations, meteors, okay. planes, clouds, uh, the ISS, the moon. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yeah, those are those are that's a really good list. We've covered just about everything that that indeed is there. So people say planes and stuff. There, there's the dividing line between astronomy. When when uh, there's a few things that interact with the atmosphere, but astronomy is generally above the atmosphere. So uh, see if you can. I'm going to pick click on my list now, and this is just what I think. It's uh, not necessarily the right answer, but it's my answer. See if you can pick out that one thing in my list. That actually, or there might be two things on my list that actually interact with the atmosphere. So let's see what happens here. First thing's the sun, and I've got a warning about that. Don't look at it directly. Um, even for a few seconds, it can damage your eyes permanently. Some of us take a sneak peek when the sun is really low on the horizon and the atmosphere is dimming it and scattering all the blue light. That's why the, uh, the uh, sky's blue and leaving just the red sunlight left through. And you can 
you can sneak a peek, I guess, but you really shouldn't. When it's up in the sky, two or three seconds can cause permanent damage. Uh, one of my high school colleagues watched part of a solar eclipse. Um, people had told her, you know what, it might hurt. So she covered one eye and she watched the eclipse with the other eye. And today she's blind in that eye still. So please don't look at the sun. And now the rest of my list, I got stars, the moon, planets, meteors, uh, comets, northern lights. Nobody said northern lights. Are there anybody from, from the prairies on? You get fabulous view of the northern lights. I saw and, one more good one, Ian. I'll just add in. Oh, Someone said, I remember I saw an orange glowing star beside the moon. Ah, wow. Well, there's an orange. So two things that could be, it could really be a, an orange star because the moon travels the sky and sometimes is close to an orange star called Antares. But I bet it was Mars because Mars is really bright. And if you look in the east sky at sun at sunset right now, Mars is beautiful, uh, um, uh, orangey glow. So I bet that's what that was. So if you, these two things that interact with the atmosphere, the meteors, of course, they go through the air and burn up really quickly. And you see the air glow for a second. So almost always it's not the little rock burning up, it's the air glowing. Um, and then the northern lights too. And uh, and there are southern lights in obviously the South Pole. The other one I didn't hear anybody sit, talk about was the Andromeda galaxy. And just let me get back to that later. Um, so uh, first North American astronomers. Um, and, and I think this goes for, you know, because we're here in North America, I thought I would focus on the North Americans, but any culture really, and it's full of the history of, of interpretations and stories about the night sky with common themes, you know, whether it's a, a East Asian, South Asian, uh, Australian, um, Aboriginal, um, sorry, uh, Indigenous, uh, the Mayans, our indig uh, Indigenous populations too. Very similar themes come, come from looking at the night sky. The first one I, is, is everybody has star patterns. And so, I mean, imagine yourself now maybe 10,000 years ago on the shores of Lake Superior and you're looking over, over it and, and you see the, this constellation above your head and you say, wow, that looks a lot like the bear I just saw a few minutes ago. Why don't we call that the bear constellation? And sure enough, there are bear constellations up there. There's two of them. Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And there's all kinds of other constellations that show the things that were around us. Um, interestingly for the, uh, the Australians, um, they have snakes and stuff, so the snake constellation. And they've also got emus. And there's an emu in the sky, but it's not a constellation. The, the Southern Milky Way is so bright, you can really see the dust lanes well. And the dark dust in the, uh, in the Australian night sky looks like an emu. So it's, they actually have an emu in the sky, really cool. So lots of stories, uh, depending on the culture, lots of different interpretations of what's being seen. Uh, things change in the night sky. Uh, sometimes the moon will go red for a couple of hours and then come back again, you know, lunar eclipse. Uh, sometimes the sun goes out for a minute, solar eclipse. And so to help explain these kinds of changes, stories are, are brought up to say that this is why this has happened. Um, remember, this is before science has, has taken off and, and understood about it all. So it, it, to understand what's up there, we made stories about that. Um, the other, other story or the other important part is prediction of upcoming events. Um, when you think about the Earth orbiting the sun, um, when, when we're looking at the sun, that's daytime, but out behind us is night and that's the constellations of night and then go six months on and sun looks in the same direction from here on earth. But of course we're looking completely opposite direction from a space standpoint. So the stars behind us are completely different. So now the stars will change with the seasons and before it starts to get cold in the winter or warm in the summer, the, the new stars are coming up. So um, various cultures would look at this and go, ah, I, I know that I know the caribou move across when the constellation of the bear is sitting up high in the sky. So I see it now. We're going to get ready to go hunting, or it's time to plant the corn in the field now. Uh, so a lot of of important important um, events throughout the year for people based on what they see in that night sky. The other almost equally important one. So it's one of those things that you know why I do astronomy, trying to figure out 
the why of what's up there. And that's the, these stories are, are um, created to describe why. And I'll talk about one uh, North American First Nation story now. And it's a story called The Raven Steals the Light. And it's about um, the why behind the, why the sun is up in the sky and why the sky is filled with stars. And so parents, please share this with, with, with your kids or your neighbors or when you're over, um, talk about this. This is, the, is it, of course, it's not the real reasons there, but I think it captures the culture and captures the fascination of the families underneath the night sky. So it goes something like this. Um, long time ago, the earth was, was dark and old man who has seen here in, in his long house holding his grandchild, old man had the light and he had it in a box inside of a box inside of a box inside of a box um, so that none of the light could get out. And Raven wanted this light to play with. And he was a bit of a, a cunning person. So he he managed to catch, the, you know, dress up as, a, as maybe perhaps a young gentleman from the next tribe in the next valley. And he happened to get friendly with, with old man's daughter. And one thing led to another. They had a child, but the child was actually the Raven in disguise. And Raven, uh, you know, pestered and cajoled granddad, please granddad, let me see the light. And, and at first granddad said no, but we all know that the grandparents would give everything that, they, that, they, uh, that the grandkids asked for. Um, so a grand, the old man finally acquiesced and said, sure, you can, you can open up the boxes and see the light. And as the moment the light came out, the little boy turned back into the Raven, the Raven grabbed the light, flew up through the smoke hole in, in, in the roof of the longhouse and out into the, into the world around, around him and bathed it all in the, in the light from, the, from this little this piece of light. And that did two things. One, it brought light to the world. But number two, there was eagle sitting on, on a tree nearby. An eagle could finally see now and go, oh, I see lunch. So eagle's now starting to try and chase Raven around the sky. And in, in the battle, Raven dropped the light and it fell down to the rocks below and smashed into a million pieces. And those million little pinpoints of light bounced up into the night sky. And they are the stars of the night sky. And Raven managed to hold on to one really bright piece of light. And to this day, Ra Eagle is still chasing Raven, trying to eat him. And Raven rises in the east in the morning and crosses through the sky, flying with Eagle behind and sets at night. And that's the story of why the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It's actually Raven going across. So that's obviously not the, really the way it is, but it is a, a, a First Nation story about our, indeed, our first astronomers. So I hope you enjoyed that. Now, if you want to be an astronomer, what kind of equipment do you need? This could be another, another quick chat. What do people think they need to actually be an astronomer? You know, what kind of equipment? This is a, there's some people here on the, on the, um, uh, looking up in the night sky, they may or may not be dressed properly to do that. Um, and this is a picture of the night sky from near my observatory up near Thornbury, Ontario. And um, it shows the horrible light pollution from the city, Toronto, and it shows Jupiter is that one, and it shows the beautiful Milky Way. But what do you think you need to be an astronomer? Anybody answered it and popped well, up? Well, there's a few, and we'll maybe give people a few moments to write some things in the chat. But while we, we wait for them, um, what were some of the things that you would also, you know, have with if you were taking your family outside, Ian? What are some of the things that come to mind for you? Oh, we might have have them frozen. So I'll just read some of the ones coming in on the chat people are sharing. Uh, we have Patience. Yeah, absolutely. Patience is a big one when doing stargazing. Uh, a telescope. Yeah, you know, and you can have a telescope, but it's not absolutely a necessity. You can always just use your eyes. Binoculars are also a good one. Uh, some people are saying having a star map, having a clear night sky away from the city lights. That is absolutely important. Yeah, but you know, you can see a lot of things in the city too. You can't, it's not just uh, the city. Um, but you can see things that are also um, outside in dark sky preserves. So yeah, you can stargaze from a lot of different places. It looks like Ian's just rejoining us there. Um, people said warm clothes, curiosity. Those are all excellent things as well. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm back. 
Right. So, so your star bags. Oh, sorry about that. Who, who knows what happened here? No, it's um, all good. We were just talking about some of the ones in the chat. People said, you know, warm clothes, star map, patience, clear skies, uh, a red light to see with, friends to wow. chat with. Those are all really, really good things. Um, uh, share screen. Let me uh, go back to this one. So now, uh, are we back sharing the screen again? Uh, no, we can't see your screen yet. Oh, there we go. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, probably the biggest thing for me is, is you know, it is just your eyes, but it's more than that. It's you're taking an interest, and and you do have lots of things in in that star bag. For me, um, I actually have one of those. It looks like a little an old briefcase from work, actually. But in it, I've got things like a toque and, and mitts. I they're actually very thin gloves. Um, one of the big things that we tell people who are about to go out under the night sky is make sure you dress like it's 10 degrees cooler than it really is. Because like, pretend like you're going to be standing out in the middle of the night, uh, not, not actually moving around because that's exactly what you're doing. And so always dress a little warmer. So I've got that toque and, and little gloves in, in my star bag. I do have a red light, a dim red light, because the red light preserves your night vision. If, um, if you've ever got up in the middle of the night, uh, you know that as long as you don't turn the light on when it's dark, you can see everything in the bedroom and maybe over to the bathroom. Um, but the moment you turn the light on, it's all great until you turn the light off again. And then it's, ah, oh, because your eyes aren't dark adapted. And the red light will allow your eyes to stay dark adapted. And yes, a star map is there too. Um, the other one that, that I, I put in, in my... Uh, my thing, and, and I'll go back to this picture of, of, that I had up at the very beginning. Um, I put a stool in, in my, I've got another box as well. You might, might not be surprised that I need more than just a bag to take all my stuff out. But a stool to me is really important and it's a comfy stool and, and, um, and warm to sit on, it allows me to soak up the view through the eyepiece much better. Um, and uh, you know that to me is one of my important things. And for you, take a deck chair perhaps to sit and relax, and take some binoculars. I have binoculars in my my star bag, so something to keep warm, uh, something to help me find the, the stars, a map, something to look at the map with, and something to be comfortable out there, a chair. So that that's yeah. just like a good starter for me, anyway. Well, that's great. And I just want to add a few to Ian because sure. I've taken my young niece and nephew out and, you know, you Perfect. want to have those things for safety and comfort, but it's also nice to have fun. And I know I found this really great book called Seeing the Stars, where it has Ooh. stories about the constellations. So books are fun. I know I've like brought stickers and uh, glow sticks and notebooks or journals so you know kids can keep track of what they see mm -hmm. or draw pictures. I know you were showing me you do that too. You even draw some of the stuff you see. I do. I've got some pictures a little bit later to help to help us show what you can really see through a telescope because when we use a camera, we can see a lot more than you can really see. But the drawing is really good, and I do I do have those drawings. And even when my girls were very very young. They, I still got their little notepads and their, their pictures of what they saw, Saturn with the rings and Jupiter with its planets and the, the craters of the moon. It's really fun to look back at those. Even now they're all grown up and moved away. So, so yeah, that's the star bags. I, I really like that. Anything else in the star bags? No, great ideas oh, okay. in the chat. I think we've shared a lot of them and yeah, you've got a great list. So hopefully everyone feels like they could maybe go out and make their own family star bag. Absolutely, absolutely. I really, really do have one and I keep it by the door and anytime I go, that's the first thing to get packed in the truck, my star bag. So uh, what can you see when we're out there? And I thought I would, would share this video that I took. This is what's uh, called a stop motion video. And um, so I pointed my camera north and I'd actually intended to just take a, a little movie of the Northern Lights because um, although for you on the prairies, this is probably a very poor showing of the Northern Lights, it's pretty good for Southern Ontario. Um, and, and so I started taking this stop motion video. So it took a 30 second image uh, once a minute for 120 minutes. And then I stitched these frames together. So it looks like a video moving by. So I'll just play it once. And then I'll go back and I'll talk about what we see. So um, you'll see the Northern Lights come up and die away and uh, watch for that space station right at the very end of it. So here we go.
okay, did anybody see the space station at the very end? Well, type in if you did. So a couple of things to notice here. Number one, the Northern Lights were, were changing and then they died away. But I realized that this allowed us to, to see that the, the, the stars are not all in one place. They're, they're constantly moving. And, and you know, just like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, um, all the stars move. And of course, it's not the stars, is it? it it's us on a rotating globe. And um, I'm going to run the video again, but I want you to watch this star right here this time. And, and you can see as the video goes along, the Big Dipper comes into view and the pointer stars port, point towards this special star. And I'll run it and you tell me if you think the, this star is moving or not. And if everybody else is moving too. So here we go. And there's that star. And you see that all the stars are moving, but they're all rotating around this one star. This is Polaris up in the, the northern sky. And then unfortunately, the people in the southern hemisphere don't have a Polaris. Um, but by, by absolute chance, the Earth's pole points towards Polaris. And in a few thousand years, it won't be exact anymore. But, but what happens then is, is that uh, it looks, because the Earth points, the Earth's axis points right to there, everything else appears to move ar around Polaris. So, so it, when the sky moves, it all appears to, to rotate around it. And this is looking north, so things are going from west to east. But of course, you turn around, and that's where the sun is in the south, starting in the east and rising in the west. And, um, and that's, that's what's, what's going on there. So that's why, and that's, that's why things might change when you look at them. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up a program called Stellarium, and this is the night sky. Um, it's, a, it's a night sky planisphere, if you will, and it's, it's a free download uh, on uh, any computer. Um, there is a, a version for your, your phone as well. There's lots of apps for your phone. But uh, to use it at home, and, and you can all gather around together and sort of like preview the things you might want to look for in the night sky at night. So I'll bring up the Stellarium screen. And I'll also, if you have your star finders ready, um, have them, have them, and, and I'll, I'll display the screen here in a way that maybe will make the stars, the, the the screen a little bit make a little bit more sense. So, this is Stellarium, and it's right now here in Halifax. Um, but we don't really want this time of day, do we? We ooh, wait a minute. I want this. I'm going to go forward to sunset, and so you can see that. As I'm moving forward, the sun's moving across the sky, so's the moon. And now the sun's set. Um, let me go one more and make it nice and dark. And you can see in the southwest sky right now, um, tonight, and for you too, because it won't be very much different in Halifax. Now, um, maybe uh, up Edmonton, the moon might be actually uh, a little bit lower in the sky. And... Um, you know, but and, and then down down southern Ontario, it's a little bit higher. But um, this, is, this is where this is where it is in Halifax, um, and you can see Jupiter and Saturn are are just in the southwest now, just following the moon down because they're of course going to set in the in the southwest. Um, I really like Stellarium because it can show you the night sky, and and it help you help you look. And um, if I very gently scroll over to the east now you can see that Mars is there too. And, and uh, that's that, that, bright, that bright orange thing that somebody spied beside the moon. The moon in orbit around the Earth, of course, is in a different position night after night. Um, Stellarium allows you to do neat things like, like turn constellation lines on and off. So you, you can see things like uh, watch for this. Let me go back actually one hour here. Watch for, when I show you a, a real picture of the night sky, watch for this teapot. In, in the sky underneath the planets. It, it's the constellation of Sagittarius, and you can cheat and turn the names on too. But Sagittarius is, is a constellation that looks a lot like a teapot. It's actually a, an archer with, a, with an arrow. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, it, it did. But there's the handle, and there's the spout, and there's the lid, and then you can see where all the tea is. And the, neat, the other neat thing, I think, is that the Milky Way becomes the steam from the from the, the teapot. And this actually is right towards the center of our galaxy because the Milky Way is indeed our galaxy. So now if we if we think of the night sky and look at our star finders, and 
you, you get a star wheel and then the wheel goes inside the holder and the holder blocks out part of the wheel depending on the time of year. And you think, well, what actually am I looking at? So if I now zoom Stellarium out all the way here, you can see that, that it looks a, an awful lot like the star wheel. And that's exactly what it is. So the, the star wheel and, and what gets revealed for the specific date um, are the stars that are up over the entire night sky around you. So when you look on the star wheel to the south, you can, you can see those south stars, but realize that things like the Big Dipper over here, they're behind you, but it's all up in the night sky at the same time. You'll also notice that there's no Jupiter and Saturn or Mars posted on your, your um, uh, star finder, but there is a, a, a line. Uh, on the color ones, it's, it's often like a yellowish orange color. I don't know what it is on yours, Kaylee. Um, but uh, the, that's the path through the night sky that the planets will take. And they're always close to it. So if you're looking at, at your night sky and, and you're going, okay, what, um, uh, what am I looking at? And why is there a bright star where there's not one on my planetosphere? Well, it's probably a planet. And right now there's the Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. And if we swing around to the north, and I have to go slowly, this, uh, apparently it can make some people sick if you go too fast. You can then see that northern sky with our Big Dipper and the pointer stars pointing towards Polaris that's going to stand still and all the other stars will go around it. Uh, one other neat thing about the Mars view, and I've got a real, life, real picture of Mars here, um, is that up here in the constellation of Andromeda, there's a fuzzy thing in the sky. And maybe I won't spoil the sur surprise, um, but remember, I've talked about that fuzzy thing and remember these, these three stars here and a bit of an arc um, and underneath Mars, and you might want to get your binoculars or even look at that. We'll talk about that in a moment. So there's Stellarium and um, you can use it and play with it. You can go forward in time by years, which is kind of neat to see or, you can, or months, but let me jump a year back and you see, obviously, the stars are in the same place, same date, same time. But the planets have moved backwards. Jupiter was, was over there. Um, and then let's go back one more year. Jupiter's even already set now at this time, Saturn not. And moving forward, you can see that as time goes on and the planets orbit the sun, at where we see them uh, projected against the background sky moves with time. That's why they're called planets, because the Greek word for planet is wanderer and they're the stars that wandered. So let's go out of Stellarium for now and go back to our presentation. Um, that brings me to actually observing projects for the family with no equipment at all. So one of the things you can do is take that star finder out together, uh, perhaps look at Stellarium first and figure out what you're gonna look at because everything's more difficult in the dark. Get your red light. And learn those constellations using your star finder and adjust it to the date and time you're looking. And there'll be a little north or west or south, face that direction and hold the star finder up and find those constellations and look at them. Um, one of the, the files that, that Kaylee's gonna send you is, is a activity to draw the moon and the moon phases over the month. And you know that the, the moon changes its shape. Um, the other thing you can do is follow the motion of the planets. Um, you can't see Uranus and Neptune so well. Actually, you can't at all. You can just see Uranus if you really, really know where to look. But it kind of says something that Uranus wasn't noticed until the telescope was invented. So I bet, bet you're not going to see it because I don't without, without a telescope. But Mercury, Venus, Earth, of course, just look down. Uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn can all be seen in the night sky. And you can follow them move week after week, month after month, year after year. You can see the International Space Station. I've got a link uh, at the end of the show to, to see that. You can watch the Aurora and you can find the Andromeda Galaxy. So that was a little surprise in that picture of Mars because, oh, wait a minute. I must have, I mixed up a slide. I've got a little later, sorry about that. Let, let's, um, let's go to the moon, the moon and the moon animation now. So, There'll be a skill testing question at the end here. Um, uh, so pay attention, I guess is what I'm saying. So this is uh, an animation of the, the moon. Now the sun is out of the field of view to the left of your screen. 
and we're looking straight down at the top of the earth at the North Pole here. And so I guess it's actually a, um, probably a, a spring equinox, equal day, equal night, that, that one day of the year that, uh, that the sun shines, you know, over the course of 24 hours, the sun will get all of the planet. Because of course, in the summer, the South Pole doesn't get any light and the North Pole gets it all. And in the, in the winter for us, the North Pole is dark all the time, right? And um, so anyway, and then the, this is the moon. And you'll notice a couple of things. The Earth's going to rotate as time goes by. And the moon is going to revolve around the Earth. And that's actually why the moon's not a planet, because it's sure big enough to be a planet. But one of those little things that you need to be a planet is you need to revolve around a star. And the moon revolves around the Earth. So it doesn't. So I'm going to start this animation and stop. And uh, before I start, I guess I should finally say this is the view from Earth. And we see the full moon because uh, both the Earth and the moon are always only half lit because they're a globe. And when the moon is, is the opposite side of the, of the uh, Earth from the sun, we see the full moon illuminated. And um, that's actually not such a good astronomy time because the full moon is a big source of light pollution. Uh, and it, it drowns out a lot of the dimmer stuff. So while it might be great for romance, it's not so great for astronomy. So let's let's move on a little bit in time from the full moon. And I'll let it go and you can see that there's the Earth rotating, the moon revolving, and notice the phase of the moon, less and less of the, of the light, lighted portion of the moon that we can see. And I'll stop it right there. Okay, I went by just a little bit, but that doesn't matter. And you can see that for our view here on Earth, although continuously half the moon is illuminated and half is not, um, from our point of view, we can only see now a half a slice. And we call this last quarter. And I to say to myself, thinking of dessert, as I sometimes do, well, if that was a pie, a nice apple pie, I'd be getting half an apple pie. And that doesn't look anything like a quarter. So why ever would we call it a quarter moon? Well, the reason is because the moon has now gone one quarter of the way around its orbit. So it's gone from full to last quarter before it becomes a new moon again. And um, that's why the quarter. And of course, as the moon continues around, it goes through uh, the waxing crescent phase, waxing meaning getting smaller. And it goes through new moon where the whole lighted portion of the moon is away from us and we can't see it at all. Great time for astronomy. Um, and then the first, first um, crescent phase moon passing along, getting more and more waxing, getting uh, bigger, as I say waxing before waning is getting smaller. Past first quarter, that quarter of the, the orbit again, all the way around to full moon again. So there we go. And, and then if, if, if we continued on, um, it goes through the, the, the waning gibbous, I think I said waxing, and that this is called a gibbous phase and moving around. So the skill testing question for you to put in the chat, and uh, actually, I think we have a poll on this, don't we, Kaylee? We do, yeah. So I can launch okay. that poll now. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll just let this run and then stop. The, the skill testing of the poll says: Is the moon rotating, or does it staying, the, or is it staying still? Because the Earth is very obviously rotating, and we know that. But when we look at the moon from the Earth, you tell me, yes or no? Is the moon rotating? And I'll wait thirty seconds. Have a sip of my coffee with a suitable <laughs> eye on it. Starting to see people's responses come in. So if you, it's a 50% chance. So yes or no, feel free to vote. Oh, here we go. They're coming fast now. All right. All right. So I'll end the uh, last few seconds to add your answers and I'll end the polling and share the results. It looks like 78% said no and 22% said yes. Okay. Well, this is a typical response. And sadly, it's the wrong response. So um, think the moon does rotate, but it rotates exactly the same rate that it revolves. So now think about if I'm looking at my coffee mug and I'm going to look at it and I can see the eye there. And if I go and move, actually, I'm going to put it, put it here so you can see it. And if I move my coffee mug in orbit around my head, um, and uh, you can see that if I don't, rotate the mug, I don't see the eye, but you still do. And there it goes. So for me to always see the eye, like we always see the same surface of the sun, I have to rotate the mug 
at the same rate, and please let me not spill my coffee behind me, um, at the same rate, and I'm always pointing the eye towards my head. And that's exactly what's going on with the moon, is that it's been gravitationally locked in over the four and a half billion years. Um, it's been because the Earth was smashed by something big, and the moon was created very, very early in our history. Um, and, and what's happened now is the same face always faces us, and so the moon rotates and revolves about once a month. So there we go. Great, great answers. Um, don't feel bad if you got it wrong because you're with most people that uh, get tricked by, by it all. So anyway, that's the way it goes. Okay, uh, onwards. I hope that helps with, with the moon and stuff. So here's the, the Andromeda galaxy picture I wanted to show you. When you look for Mars, and, and I said, watch for those three stars at the, at the, at the bit there and I can zoom in a little bit, and there you can see the Andromeda galaxy. So that's an, another separate galaxy all, all um, around, um, away from all of us. So think back to that light time I was talking about in the distances. There's Mars at, at, at a close approach to us, probably only four or five light minutes away. All of these stars are in our galaxy, and in fact, even in our arm of the galaxy, maybe some of these ones over here, are in the next arm out because we're like a spiral pattern uh, of a galaxy. Um, and, and so these are hundreds to thousands of light years. But when you look at Andromeda, you're actually looking at something that is two and a half million light years away. So think of that, the light that has traveled from when I took this picture, it, it, it was around before the per first primitive humans were even on the earth. And it was traveling all that time just for me and you two. And you can see that with the unaided eye just by using, I think you'll, it's even marked on your star finder that the Andromeda galaxy or certainly the constellation is. And uh, you can find it off the, off the end of the, 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 the um, end of those three gently, gently curved stars. Do you see that M31 maybe? Or does it say Andromeda galaxy, Kaylee? Yeah, mine says Andromeda galaxy and there's a small circle to show where it is. Perfect. Yeah, you don't need anything to find that. Just, just outside and a dark sky. Don't try and do it in full moon. If you're down, if you're downtown Vancouver, head up to the mountains. You're not going to see it in the light pollution. Um, I'm fortunate enough here, 30 minutes from Halifax, that it's a nice dark sky here. I can see it from my backyard. Not, not last night. It was pretty cloudy. So, uh, next part of um, observing projects. Um, so that's the family observing w without using any any equipment, there's lots of things you can do with binoculars and, and you can start looking at all the things we, are, we, we talked about, but you can do details of the moon. So much like my girls did in their younger days, I, I put the telescope or binoculars on the moon and they were to draw the, the planets, uh, sorry, draw the, the craters and, and uh, my younger science interested one drew the crater inside a crater and that, that happens all the time. We know one hits and then, few hundred thousand years later another one hits inside and there's no weather on the moon to rub out the craters so they see that you can also follow Jupiter's moons one of the the the, the, the um, activities that we talked about there was following Jupiter's moons this is is a uh, from Galileo's logbook he was an Italian astronomer 400 years ago and he first turned his very modest telescope which is not really much more powerful than the, than the current binoculars he turned that to the night sky and he saw the, the disk of Jupiter and he saw these four points of light that would change their position by the day and even by the hour. And so you too, with only binoculars, can follow Jupiter's moons and record them and see, oh, I knew where they were last night. Let's have a look tonight. And think back 400 years and think to yourself, would I have been able to figure out that these were actually moons around another planet? And uh, Nobody ever knew about that before. So it really shows the, the depth of thought that Galileo would have had to have to figure that one out. You can explore the Milky Way with binoculars. And here's the Milky Way shining up through there. Um, forgive the light pollution from Toronto. But um, these are clouds in our night sky, by the way. But there's tons of things to see in the Milky Way. What binoculars should you use for astronomy? Um, there's a couple of things, you know, you buy binoculars with magnification times lens diameter. And that's the, the thing that says, you know, eight times 56 or something on the back of the binoculars. Um, 
And you need something somewhere between seven and 15 times of power magnification. Um, the inexpensive binoculars that have zoom, uh, they don't give a clear view, I'm afraid. They might be okay for a sports event, but not so much for astronomy. And you, you probably need to steady your view with increasing magnification. I either put a, um, a tripod on my, my binoculars, often this little screw at the end comes off and you can screw the, the, uh, the, little, the little one quarter by 20 thread into your binoculars to hold them up. But um, I often just use a tree or in that deck chair that I've taken out, I snuggle down on the deck chair and put my arms on the, on the, um, the uh, my arms on the chair's arms and then steady my view and that, that works really well. And then the diameter there, those is in millimeters. And basically the bigger, the better to a point, they get too heavy when they get too big. But 42, 50 is even better than that. Um, the ones I have are these, they're uh, these ones right here. Doesn't help me see you any better, but anyway, that's that's that. Um, and, and they are eight by 56 and you can get them online from lots and lots of Canadian telescope stores that sell them. Um, and they're fabulous. Uh, to, to get started. Um, so that's that's what I have. And Ian, you I'm just going to throw in oh. a quick plug, if you yeah. don't mind. I also, yeah. for really, really young kids, I've made toilet paper roll binoculars too, just because oh, yeah. little kids might have a hard time with some of the bigger equipment. So you can always make your own as well. That's true. That's a, that's a great project inside. And Although there's no magnification, it does isolate the night sky, and you and you know your brain works in weird and wonderful ways. They'll actually see more with those. What a great idea! That's fabulous. Um, so one of the other things you can do, you know, I've talked about never look at the sun. You can actually put the cover on one of the lenses of your binoculars and make a little cardboard shade, like I've shown in the picture here, and much like a, a computer presentation projector or the old slide projector, you can project the image of the sun back onto a piece of paper, but just never, never look, not even to try and center it. It'll be over in a second if you do that. But it is how Galileo did it and how, how you can see some of the sunspots and things with just binoculars. So now if we move on to just a small telescope, um, there's lots and lots of things you can see with a telescope. Um, phases of Venus. This is Venus in its crescent phase. Galileo discovered that it had that. You can see planet details and I've got some drawings of what I've taken a little later. You can see sunspots and then moving on from that there's all kinds of observing projects and they're listed here on our RASC website and, and these programs do things like uh, observe the moon that talks about various little craters. Observe the universe is a great one to start with because it identifies about 60 different Taught things to look at, a great list for families to start with, with either just binoculars or, or, um, or um, a small telescope. Indeed, some of the observed universe things are, are completely unaided sky. So these observing lists are great. The other ones, things like Messier lists, these are from lists that people back through history started to make as, as they started to discover things about the night sky. And you too can look there. There's just so many things to look at. Um, if you want a telescope, I'll go fairly quickly through the telescope stuff because I see that I'm taking a little bit too long of a time here. Um, three things you need about a telescope. And this is a telescope that I've used to take some of the pictures for this show. And um, it, it, it's my homemade telescope. It has a, a, a mirror in the bottom, not a lens. It's eight, um, 200 millimeters in diameter. Um, when you go to a store and buy them, it'll, they'll call it an eight inch. So that's the diameter of the mirror. And as you can see, it, I mean, it's, it's got good enough objects to show objects nicely. It gathers a lot of light to see the things that I want to see. And it's got a really stable mount. So imagine, you know, on our rotating earth and you point towards a planet and you've got fairly high magnification and every 20 or 30 seconds, the whole thing skews off. And then if you've got one of those rickety mounts, how do you find it again? You know, it's, very difficult. So these stable mounts are really, really important. Um, and these are some of the images that I've taken with really small telescopes. Uh, these two images were taken with that eight inch telescope, same with the moon, actually maybe not this Jupiter, but you can see that, that kind of a stuff right there through a, a modest telescope. And that kind of hints at what do you want to look at for a telescope? If you want to look at just these kinds of things, solar system objects, you don't need a big one. Uh, maybe an 80 millimeter lens is all you need. But as soon as you want to look at deep sky objects, 
you need that light gathering power. And these are images that I've taken with a bigger telescope and it's not gonna look like this, but with long exposures, it can. The other thing to consider with a telescope is where you want to observe. Is it on your balcony? And if so, big heavy thing is probably not great. Can you just zip out to the backyard? Do you need to get in the car and go outside of the city? So think about the telescope you can use to transport. My little eight inch um, reflector there, I can literally pick, I, you see I've made it with a handle on the top there. So I pick one side up with one hand and the mount up with the other, walk out the door, set it down and I, and I can observe. So for me, that's, that's actually my favorite telescope. It's not my biggest telescope or anything, but it's my favorite because it, I can use it at the drop of a hat. I've taken it camping. This is up at Silent Lake Provincial Park in the, uh, near Bancroft, Ontario. And away from the light pollution, you can see the beautiful sky. So that really is an advantage to think about where you're going to observe with the telescope, should you want one. If you want to take images, uh, everybody says, I want to take a picture of the telescope. My recommendation is later, not now. It's too much stuff. You see there's actually two telescopes, camera, the computer on the, on the tailgate of my truck out here. Uh, don't go there yet. This is the kind of thing you should get. This is a commercial Dobsonian telescope. A six inch or an eight inch will do. And uh, you can buy these at any astronomy shop. The six inch version is just a little over $400. The eight inch version is a little under 600. But really the thing here is you don't need a telescope. If you join RASC, um, little plug for us, many of the centers have telescopes that we loan to members. So you can try before you buy. You don't actually even need to ever buy a telescope. You can just, you know, when the telescope's available, loan it again. You know, hey, we're going up to the mountains for a weekend. I'm going to get a loaner scope. Um, so what things can you see? This is a list of, uh, of all the stuff. And you can see that you can see billions of stars, thousands of galaxies. And this is all with an eight inch telescope, uh, star clusters, glowing nebula with new stars forming and the end of life for other stars. Uh, the odd supernova, all the planets, comets, all kinds of stuff. You can see tons of stuff. And now what will you see? These are drawings I've made with that homemade eight inch telescope. So this is Jupiter and you can see the, the dark cloud bands and the, the lighter colored zones and Jupiter rotates very quickly. You can see one of the Galilean moons there. That one happens to be Europa. That's the one that might have water on it and life, who knows, beneath the ice. So you can see quite a lot of detail through a little telescope. And then looking beyond our solar system, what I've done here is I've made a drawing with, with pencil and, and white paper, and then through the magic of Photoshop, just inverted it so it looks more like a nighttime image. But this is a, a drawing I've made of something called the Swan Nebula, a place where new stars are forming. And you can see it does actually look a little bit like a swan sitting in the water. Um, and then these are some of the galaxies that I've taken pictures of. These things are um, tens of millions of light years away. And then you can see that they look different. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. There's many of those observing lists to go. But again, get out under the night sky as a family together. Start with just your star finder, your star and your, your star bag and move on slowly from there. And um, so that's telescopes, what you can see. Um, and then I thought I'd talk a bit about light pollution, um, and I'll move fairly quickly through this because I do want to get to that, that you too can be a scientist thing at the end of our show. So these are three, these are artist impressions, except for the 70s and the 1997 image. The 50s, we didn't have satellites up to look for what the light pollution would look like, and it's not 2025 yet, so this is obviously projected. But this is what the night sky looks like looking down at North America from Orbit, uh, mostly the United States, I guess, and it shows an ever increasing glow. And where we are now is somewhere between 97 and 2025. It's, we're right on track to, to be terrible light pollution there. And this is a, actually what $5 billion looks like. Have you ever wondered what a pile of $5 billion looks like? Well, this is it, because that's what it costs to make the light just to shine to space. So uh, we really need to stop doing that because think about how we make electricity. There's some nice clean ways to make electricity, but there's a lot of burning oil and coal and there's an environmental impact to making the electricity that's just wasted. So what does it look like down here on earth? Back in 19, I think it was 90, no, 2003, 
uh, we had a little bit of an oops on the eastern seaboard. Um, the state of Ohio didn't follow the rules and they happened to short out the electrical grid for everybody. Um, my history, work history, is I worked at the nuclear power plant uh, on Lake Ontario. And, uh, you know, I got out of the shower one night and uh, about getting ready to go into night, night shift and the lights went brown and then they went out and I thought, oh, that can't be good. And wow, that was a busy night to try and get the lights back on. But, the, you know, the shorting out of the electrical power grid turned out all the lights everywhere. So uh, Todd Carlson here took this picture of neighbor's house um, at some point before the, uh, I don't think it was the night before, he didn't have a premonition of it, but still it shows how light polluted his night sky was before the power failure. And then of course, when it all happened, this is what he saw, I don't know, wow, what a difference. And that's what's hiding behind the light pollution for you. It's why you need to get to a dark sky to see things up there. And it's probably why we need to stop wasting so much. Um, I do think some night sky is necessary. I won't talk to the words, but look at the picture here. And this is a roadway and the intersection is lit so that somebody in a car who's driving up with the lights on, of course, is gonna be able to see that I gotta stop there. And if a pedestrian is walking across, you can see where the, where the walkway is and it's, it introduces the, the nighttime safety and the lights are not shining in the dries of the eyes of either the pedestrian or the driver. So this is the kind of what it should be, if you will. Um, there are some downsides to light pollution. Everything has adverse effects. And reduced safety on the road is one of the big ones. Um, the light will shine in your eyes and prevent you from seeing things. Um, you know, the darker skies, your eyes open up and allow you to see details. And if the street lights are shining in your eyes, it actually becomes less safe. Um, upsets circadian rhythms of all kinds of things, humans. Um, lowers our resistance to illness by, by not sleeping as well. Same with animals, it upsets all of their patterns. Definitely with, with, with life cycles for, for migration and feeding and uh, reproduction, all of the plants, animals, birds get adversely affected by, by light at night. Um, and of course, wasting tons of money. Um, so I've got a couple of examples of bad lighting and good looking lighting. So my buddy Grant lives out in BC and I asked him to run out and take a picture of the night sky and he didn't know it, but he actually got Jupiter in the picture. See Jupiter right there? Uh, so he's an astronomer, he doesn't even know it. But anyway, this is his street in Port Coquitlam and these lights shine brightly in his eyes. They light up the house, they light up the grass, all the way down the street, wasting electricity. Contrast that to the view that my brother-in-law took from Dundas, Ontario. And yes, there's still lights, but they're illuminating the crosswalk and the stop sign. And only that, you can see that it goes down the street dimly. It only illuminates the trees where the light is actually shining on the branches, not into the back here, not lighting up the houses. So what a difference. And another example of how light shining in your eyes can, can hide what's there. You know, perhaps this pedestrian is about to step out onto the edge and with a shielded light, you can see it. So that's all great. Oh, sorry, effects on animal life. Because um, uh, I'm running short of time, I'll just talk about the turtles. There's, there's two really recent effects with that. Um, in uh, Hilton Head, South Carolina, they've recently passed a bylaw to, uh, to not allow lighting on the beaches because these sea turtles come up in the darkness and lay their eggs in the sand. And the, they noticed that down in, in, in South Carolina that that wasn't happening anymore. And they realized, oh, it's because we've let everybody turn their lights on and light up the beach. So they, they introduced the law, no more lights on the beach. And guess what? The turtles are nesting there again. And even more interesting, I think, do you remember in the pandemic, in the early weeks, people were actually staying inside, like they should be now, and, and not not going outside, not you know, not turning their lights on as much. And satellite images actually showed less light pollution. Well, South Asia, there's a, there's a beach that the turtles were nesting on. And I say the word were because they went away for a while. And in the early weeks of the pandemic with the dark beach, they came back and started the nest again. So it really does have an effect. Um, what can you do? So there's a couple of things, um, and I think this is another one of those. One of those. Uh, do you want to uh, poll the audience and ask about what they can do here, Kaylee, or what do we think? Sure. Yeah. If you guys want to add your ideas into the chat while Ian goes through this slide, then we can share some of your thoughts as well. 
Sure. Yeah. So, so what, what, um, what, what I want you to think about is sitting at your house. What do you think you could do to try and reduce the light pollution that would, that would make it safer, would allow the, the, the plant life and the animal life around you to not be so adversely affected that might save you some money, things like that. So uh, any answers so far? Any thoughts so far? Uh, one person said use lights only as needed. Very important. Yeah, I know I actually went around and changed quite a few um, uh, light bulbs in the way, like my outdoor lighting. So it was more directional. Perfect. I did that outside yeah, my house. Yeah, me too. Uh, there's all kinds of things. Any, any other ideas from, from the people out there? No, nobody okay. else yet. All right. Well, yeah. So that if you could share will, some, that I would will. be great. So the oh, first thing to me is right lighting. And it's exactly the things that you, Kaylee, and, and I have already done. It's, it's shielding our lights uh, using something that only gives it the amount of light that we needed, that's the lower wattage bulbs. And that can be done through the, the various fixtures. They call these full cutoff lights. So this is of course unshielded. Timers are important. I've got those in my backyard. I've also got a motion detector that turns on more because a, a, a moth has flown in front than, or an animal than, than anything else. But still, the light's not on all the time. But if I step out back and want to take the garbage out or something, on comes the light for me that I don't fall down and it goes off again. So that's perfect. The other thing you can do, and these are much more difficult, talk to neighbors, talk to companies, talk to governments. I've done that. It, it's a lot of time. It has to be your passion. And so, you know, I'll encourage you if it is your passion to, to do that. Lots of help from the International Dark Sky Association. But probably one of the, the neatest things you can do, you can do the survey. And this is that citizen science project. So it's called the Globe at Night, and it is a monthly sky survey at the time when the moon is not in the sky, and, and that you complete from your location and report in from exactly what you see. So what I'll do is instead of, instead of this, I'll share, I'll drag my screen over here and share the night sky thing here. So hold on. So here is the Globe at Night website live right now from, from my home in Nova Scotia. And what it does is, is it, it automatic the app that you can download for your phone or use on, on the, the computer like this, is that it automatically fills in the date and time. So now I did this a little earlier. I guess I could, uh, uh, dare I? Yeah, okay, why not? So there we go. There, there's there's the, uh, the, the, the time now. And I'll zoom back out so we can see the whole province. Um, and and uh, get, picks up the exact time. If you're out under the night sky, you can turn it red so it doesn't affect your night, night vision. Um, and you can describe or just map it where you did your, your, your observations. Uh, describe some little things about say, okay, there's a street light near me or uh, there's the store where you know, the pizza place is around the corner or whatever. But then what you do is you look up in the part of the night sky and this particular one is, is near the constellation of Cygnus. Of course, you could use your star finder to find that. And between the group of you, you look up and you see how many stars you might see. So if you're downtown Toronto or, or downtown Calgary, Calgary is actually the worst for light pollution in the whole country. A buddy of mine was an airline pilot and he said, flying into Calgary, that's the brightest of all. You would you kind of think that maybe Montreal, Toronto and Vancouver would beat it. Sadly, no. Anyway, um, so downtown Calgary, you might only see Vega, the one star. Perhaps, perhaps something like downtown Halifax, you might see this. My backyard, I, I see this many stars. My daughter, who lives right down here at the, the, the tip of Nova Scotia, she sees all kinds of stars from her backyard. So what you do is you pick what you can see, and, and you, you leave that selection there. You pick how many clouds there were in the night sky, you might say something else. This sky, sky quality meter is another thing that's in my star bag, but you probably don't have one. It just measures how bright the sky, the sky is. And I'll include that reading when I do my reporting. And then I won't press that button because it's not real. Uh, but you send the data in and then that goes into a repository run by a group of scientists associated with the Dark Sky Association. And when a town or city wants to do some night sky uh, measurements or how what do we change to make it better they look at your data and the data from everybody else and they make decisions based on real science so this is how you too can be a citizen scientist and let me minimize that screen and go back to here so globe at night really cool 
you too, as a group, can go and do and be real scientists. I'll leave you now with a couple more slides here. This is the inspiration, and, and for me, big inspiration. So uh, a bunch of years ago, uh, NASA launched the Hubble Space Telescope outside of the atmosphere, no light pollution, no wobbling atmosphere to, to blur things, it takes some really spectacular pictures. And the, the Hubble scientists decided, well, let's just take a really long exposure image and see what's out there. And they chose a very small part of the sky. They didn't choose this sky. This is there to show you the size of the sky they took. So here's the moon to scale. There's a one degree field of view. And this is the field of view of the extreme deep field of Hubble. And the moon, next time you're out under a dark sky, go outside and hold your finger out at, at arm's length and hold your pinky up and you'll see that the nail of your pinky will actually completely cover the moon. So although it looks big in the sky, it's really quite small. The point of that is, is that you, this is a very, very tiny part of the sky that Hubble Space Telescope opened its, its camera to. And they opened the shutter for a hundred hours and they purposely selected a part of the sky where they didn't see in, in most normal pictures, they didn't see anything. So they thought, well, let's, I wonder what's out there, which is kind of why we do it all anyway. And this is what they saw. They saw nothing but galaxies, 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 as far as the eye could see. There are a couple of stars. Um, the, the, uh, the, the telescope style, is, the Hubble Space Telescope is a reflector, and so uh, much to my, like my little eight inch. Um, and and the, the, the apparatus of the telescope to hold the secondary mirror uh, causes some diffraction, causes some star spikes. So that lets you know what's a star and what's not. So there's one there, and there's one there, and I think there's one more somewhere else, but I can never find it when I have to. But there's galaxies everywhere, as far as you can see galaxies. Now, they're not all as big as the Milky Way, but some are much bigger. And so on average, a galaxy might have a hundred billion stars. And to put that number in perspective, if I asked you to count one second at a time, one, two, three, four, and I said, stop at a million, you'd get there in just over 11 days. So that's not such a big deal. I mean, you might be a little tired with not sleeping at night, but you can get there. And if I asked you to count to 1 billion, it would take you 32 years. And then now think of that, that's just 1 billion. Think of every one of these galaxies, these 3 trillion galaxies that are out there, every one of them having 100 billion stars. Most stars, it seems now from our research, have planets. Some planets have life. Think of all the life you're looking at out there and how much there is to explore and how little we really know about all of it. So to me, that's the inspiration for why, you know, what's out there, what's going on. And, and I love it, I really do. Here's some resources to look at. The, the Night Watch book by a fellow RASP member, Terrence Dickinson, um, it, he's got several editions of it. It was It is the book that I would have liked to have had when I was starting it. He hadn't written it yet when I started astronomy. There's webs, all kinds of website sites. Um, yeah, I think Kaylee's got these that she can send later if you want. Um, uh, one of the ones that I wanna highlight here is this uh, Astro Geo. And if you just Google Astro Geo and Skylights, one of my astronomy colleagues, Chris Vaughn is his name. He's an astronomer, he's also a geologist, so Astro Geo. And every week he writes this article called Skylights and you can get that delivered to your email and it's what's up in the night sky for the next week. Sometimes he talks a bit about day, daytime stuff, but it's a really good weekly article all about what's up, what you can see. So that's really good. So that's the end of the end of the show. Here's the, the credits, the end is always the credits. I do wanna highlight one thing here. The show this that we've done here, Kay, I, I've got Kaylee here as one of the credits here because uh, we've had lots of chats and what you've just seen today is very much a collaborative effort here. Uh, Kaylee's made lots of suggestions for me to make it more family friendly. So I think she deserves every bit as much credit as all the other people who contributed. So thank you, Kaylee. Um, I think maybe I'll stop sharing the screen and we can look for questions and things like that. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, thank you so much, Ian. And, you know, thank you all for sticking with us. I know, you know, we went a bit over, but there's so much to cover. Sorry. So many ideas. Oh, no, it's all good. <laughs> you know, from, you know, using your just your eyes to binoculars and telescopes. There's so much for you guys out there. 
Uh, I would encourage you guys also to check out our Wild Family Nature Club page because we do have a whole section on stargazing for families and how, you know what you should bring and what you can can look for. Uh, we'll send some links to you. You'll get lots of resources both from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and the Canadian Wildlife Federation. So for those of you who have to leave, that is fine. We've recorded the session and we'll share it with you. But for those of you that have questions and don't mind sticking around, if you wanna throw your questions in the Q&A, please do so. And we'll get uh, Ian to help answer them or, or me sure. though, he's, he's the expert here, so. <laughs> so. I did see one question in the chat and obviously was, was there when I was talking about pollution is what's the difference between red and blue light? Well, uh, you know, scientifically, blue light has a has a shorter wavelength than red light. Uh, you know, red, red light might be longer wavelength, blue light shorter. But effect on us um, that comes about the first LED lights we we had for light pollution uh, awareness and abatement were um, um, they were really skewed towards the blue end of the spectrum, and we discovered that blue light actually doesn't give you those benefits of of, of um, darker you know, your body being able to make melatonin to help fight illnesses, things like that. And it adver it still adversely affected all of the, the environment around us. So the LED lights that we have now are much more balanced and much less blue in, in their spectrum. So it's all about right lighting, I guess, is, is what the, the answer to that, that difference between red and blue light. Yeah, that's a good question, because I know even I never really realized that lighting made such a big difference until I went to a dark sky party and learned about the impacts that light can have both on, you know, wildlife and what you see in the sky. Oh, yeah, I remember. I'm, I'm jealous of you. You went to that Mount Kobo or was it something, a star party or something, didn't you? Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm jealous. That's one of the truly dark sky sites that, that we have. So. Oh, I think. Any other? Yeah. Uh, oh, no. Yeah. Uh, that one's different. I had a, a quick question. I mean, I, you know, I was a really a beginner when I first started. Um, but like, what are, what's the best time of year, would you say, to, to go out and do stargazing? So it's really any time that captures your interest. The only thing to remember is that I'll sometimes, you know, read, read a, you know, maybe I'm reading Chris's article and, oh, Venus is right next to the moon. And it's like January the 15th. And I'll, dash outside in my PJs and go, oh, I didn't think to wear, bring my star kit. And no, oh, I've got my slippers on still and there's snow in them, darn it. So thinking about what you're going out into, but really any time of the year, um, I find depending on where you are, it can be better or worse. Now, um, Edmonton in the summer is not the greatest because it doesn't get really, really dark around the 21st of of June, same, or if it does, it's only for a very few hours, same in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, uh, personally, I find the skies are most steady in the fall. There's no bugs as well. But really any time, you know, springtime is when the galaxies are big and up there. Summer is when the summer Milky Way is to the south. And we think we've got a good Milky Way. Just go to the southern hemisphere and look at theirs. Wow. Um, the, the, the fall is, is uh, is things like star clusters on the northern part of the Milky Way, and 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 then through the winter, there's other big things right up high. Lots of galaxies up high too. Um, so really, any time. But um, if I had to guess, I'd I'd say fall is probably best for having all those things rolled in. So, well, and maybe and winter, winter time oh, too, because the the sun goes down a bit earlier. So for families, you can get out a bit earlier too. Hey, <laughs> very yeah, very good point. I mean, uh, even now it's it's dark enough to to share the night sky six thirty quarter to seven here anyway. Um, and and yeah, that's not so much in the summer when it's like ten o'clock before it's really starting to get to get dark here in southern Ontario. Well, right. here in either Nova Scotia or southern Ontario not so much even for you up in Calgary it's probably mm. still quite bright at, at 10 in, the, in June so yeah good point good yeah. point and, the, and the, the sky is longer when I'm taking astronomy images um, around about the, that 21st of June I've only got four true dark hours um, here here at like 43 44 degrees north of the equator um, in in December I've got like 14 dark hours and so a huge difference of the, the amount of time so uh, anyway, there we That's go. Great. Uh, I saw a question come in from Bruce. If the image of stars are millions of light years to reach the Earth, is it possible that the current actual physical star can be gone? 
Absolutely, and that's one of those those neat things. And the individual stars that we see, uh, apart from a few supernova in external galaxies, um, we see the individual stars in our galaxy, which is as a diameter only about a hundred thousand light years across, and we're thirty thousand out from the middle. So, you know, it might not be millions of light years to all the stars we see, but for sure. Um, there's uh, there are some stars out there that have probably gone supernova that we don't know yet, and we won't know until the light takes its time to come. Most certainly, I mean, even that Andromeda galaxy, galaxies slowly rotate as well, and Andromeda galaxy rotates maybe once every 250 million years. So, you know, um, you know, sorry, 250 thousand, not 250 million, and and so you think the lights come for two million years? Well, the whole thing has gone around four or five times as the light's been coming. So imagine the, the spiral pattern of light coming towards us. So yes, absolutely. Everything is indeed different from what you see out there and the stars might be gone. Mm. Yeah, and then one comment just saying uh, from Michelle that she's planning to take a group of youth out to explore the sky in Vancouver. So this has been super helpful. And oh, she's gonna start looking for contacts. So any ideas of you know, maybe to contact she, where she could get started? Yeah, probably the, the RASC Vancouver Center, and they'll steer you towards all kinds of stuff. Um, they'll have a public outreach person. I don't know that that person, but but whoever she or he is, they'll they'll much like I do. Somebody will type in a question, and I'll answer, and then send them off on their merry way. And so RASC RASC Vancouver will help a lot. I think there's another RASC Center in Kelowna, um, and there's definitely one in Victoria as well. And I oh, think the Fraser Valley Library um, has telescope loan program, which is- Oh, really that's right. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that, that would be fabulous. And, you know, just get uh, get inland a little bit, if you will, or get over to the island and somewhere a little bit darker. Um, yeah, Vancouver's getting quite big. And don't go on my, my buddy Grant Street in Port Coquitlam. It's way too bright. <laughs> and Stanley Park or something also, it's right downtown. You might think, oh, it's darker, but- not much. You probably have to, you know, Squamish would be pretty good. Mm. It's, it's up the highway a bit, uh, right towards my favorite playground, <laughs> which is, of course, Whistler. But anyway, <laughs> not this year, I'm afraid. So, yeah, that, that would be good. Uh, Rast Vancouver Center. Just the last few couple questions. Uh, Beverly asked, sure. how big is our galaxy compared to others? So, it, it's actually one of the larger ones, um, and galaxies can be, you know, we measure them by by two things, probably first and foremost, by number of solar masses that they have. And we can estimate that with our sun being one solar mass, obviously. Um, uh, and, and some stars are as big as 20 or 30 solar masses. Most stars are like a tenth of the mass of the sun. So um, our galaxy is about a hundred billion solar mass galaxy. Um, and so somewhere between 100 and 200 billion individual stars. And it's 100,000 light years from one side to the other. And as we look towards the center of our Milky Way from here, the actual number, I think, is 27,000 light years to the center of our galaxy. Wow. So think about what's going on 27,000 light years away. Um, uh, and, and so that's the physical size of our galaxy. And it's shaped like a dinner plate, so very flat and, uh, and round. And then if you picture a, a pinwheel um, or you know, water going down a drain, the stars are concentrated in those arms of the galaxy. And we're in one, and when we look towards the center, we see the next arm in closer. And when we look the other way, we see the next arm of the galaxy further out. And uh, yeah, it's bigger than most. Um, between us and the Andromeda galaxy inside that 2.6 million light years or whatever, there's about 30 or 40 galaxies, and most of them are tiny. The picture of Andromeda that I showed, some may have noticed two fuzzy objects next nearby those are smaller galaxies orbiting andromeda we've got a few that orbit us the two main ones are the the large and small magellanic clouds which look like detached parts of the milky way if you're down in australia or new zealand or south africa not from here can't see it from here but uh, okay. anyway yeah so much Lots to see different... hey? there is yeah. so much to see and galaxies are so different in size but yeah it's probably one of the bigger ones and um, we actually have more mass than Andromeda. Andromeda looks bigger physically, but we have more mass. And it's one of the few galaxies that's actually moving towards us because the universe is expanding, getting bigger, and most things are moving away. Andromeda is close enough that it's moving towards us. 
in a couple billion years, we're going to pass through each other. And the gravity of our more massive galaxy will tear apart the Andromeda galaxy. So wow. We're going to win. Guess we won't be there <laughs> to see that, though. <laughs> no, afraid not. That's one of the sad things about life, but that's uh, the way it goes. And Hope then I guess, uh, yeah, and there's another just great comment from Ravi. Um, great session as a ham radio operator. I've done satellite tracking and have been interested in astronomy. Ah. So it would be really fantastic to do uh, a real time session on a clear night. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'd like to do that. I, I, we've done that a little bit. Um, I had a session of the planet party with the University of Toronto early September, and we got some clear skies and we got some cloudy skies. Uh, a couple of weeks back, I did do live views of the planets. Well, last night, I was hoping to do one with the Thornbury Library, but unfortunately, it got clouded out. So that happens. And you can live stream uh, planets views and also some deep sky objects with uh, the stop motion video becomes a new frame every four or five seconds instead of instant like like the planets. But yeah, it can be done. And there's many, many places out there doing uh, doing live stream events. It's It's fabulous. Well, and it's so great to go to the events, but I know so often like I would go to a star party and it would be cloudy and you end up doing other things. But the yeah. beauty of stargazing is you can just walk outside. You could check, you know, make sure the forecast is clear. And then on that night, you almost have to take advantage of it and just run out when it's, when it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even if you're tired, oh, let me go and have a look. And, and, and you're right. The view through the telescope is so much better for a couple of reasons. I mean, number one, it's the real thing. Number two, our, our brains process what we see. So when I show a video of a planet, you look at it and you go, oh, that's not so clear. Because when you look through the eyepiece with the, at the telescope, your brain, it just rejects all the fuzz and it focuses on the sharp bits and you actually see a clearer image than, than what the camera sees. So it's way better to be, be live. But second best is, is the live stream events. Um, one of the things, and it, maybe it's a little bit of a plug, but this, this guy's uh, an, an Ottawa person, um, Rock Mallon of Mallon Cam. He runs lots and lots of these, these outreach events using the cameras that he, he designs and builds here in Canada. So if you Google Mallon Cam outreach, there'll be all kinds of stuff to look for videos. Awesome. Yeah. So many great resources. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you all so much for your comments and sticking around and asking so many great questions. Um, I think, you know, what will be great is we'll send all the different resources to you. Ian mentioned so many good ones and so many websites that are available for free. So you'll get that in the next day uh, or so as a follow up email. Uh, but yeah, I guess my, for me, I just think it's just such a great way to get outside. Just try it, go out and, and see what you can find and what you can identify, even if it's just the moon or the Big Dipper. Yeah, I, I oh, you're right, Kelly. You know what, I think back to what my fondest memories are. I used to think it was my first view of Saturn. It was my daughter's first view of Saturn, oh. right? To see her up there and wow, dad, 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 you know, it was fabulous. And so sharing that, that experience with everybody, you know, sitting by the campfire and then looking up in the night sky and, sh and dragging it all in. It's just perfect. That's perfect. Oh, um, questions and answers. I think my, you, I'm happy to share my RASC email that, that you've got. And if people here want to ask questions, I'll do my best. And if I don't know the answer, and frequently I don't, I'll find somebody that does. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And sorry if we missed anything, but yeah, I guess we'll, we'll end it there. I know it's the bottom of the hour and people probably have lots to do, but keep asking the questions. Uh, we'll share some information so you can uh, find out more Perfect. details and just, I guess, keep the, your curiosity, go and find the answers where you need them. To. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for providing the opportunity for Rask and, and for me for this, Kaylee. Thank you very much. Well, and thank you again, Ian. It's been such a pleasure okay, and have a you. wonderful afternoon, everyone. All right, thanks. We'll, we'll do it again sometime. Sounds good. <laughs> Bye. All right. Bye-bye.